discussion also centers on this, uh, whether federalism is imposed or it is negotiated. And the conclusion is usually that it works when it's negotiated. Um, and it also depends on how it is negotiated and when uh, it is negotiated and what is the context. Um, and there, um, maps make a difference, right? Because um, in Belgium, as we saw, uh, they almost, almost fully match the ethnic division of the country, uh, with the very minor exception of the German-speaking, uh, very, very small part of uh, Belgium. Um, and um, the reason why we had uh, such a, such a uh, bloody and terrible conflict in former Yugoslavia is that the borders did not match ethnic divisions. And um, was federalism in Yugoslavia imposed or negotiated? And, and, and Thomas asked to, to spend a little time on that. Um, I think um, one of the answers lies in the maps. And this is the map that most people know uh, if they have studied or at least followed the news in the 90s. This is the map, the mental map they had in the head of former Yugoslavia with the six republics. Um, and now also with the Kosovo conflict aware that there were also two provinces in Serbia, of which one in particular had a very uh, significant ethnic group that was non-ethnic in Serbia, which was Albania. And um, most people think that this is the map that's been there for a very long time. Actually, it's very arbitrary, and it could have looked different. And if we um, look onto the next slide, and I only chose a couple. Uh, this is how we started in 1914 with the two empires. And of course, there were very different maps before that. In Serbia, you know, favorite map of Serbia going to all, all the way to North Greece. You know, we, each country has their favorite map when we have this territory. Uh, with uh, uh, Croatia for a very small period having a small state lived in the Middle Ages, their favorite map. Um, and, um, but essentially, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire broke apart, only Serbia had the constitution and some form of governance uh, that the rest of the country inherited. And then, uh, so it was a, a different type of, of arrangement. And there were these councils that were formed in different parts of the former uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they all joined together. And again, <coughs> it wasn't very many people who were members of these councils. They were not elected. Uh, so it was the elite, uh, uh, so uh, about a dozen people, or maybe 20 people in each of the parts uh, that made this decision. And one can go back and say, you know, who gave them the right to, to negotiate on behalf? Uh, but, you know, those are the questions we form now and we perceive a lot of differently. It is also interesting that some of these councils first joined Serbia, like Montenegro and Morbidina Council, and then that it, it also implies that by joining Serbia, we're also joining this new Yugoslavia. And of course, there is this big debate about whether the Serbian elite made a mistake at this point to go into Yugoslavia. Uh, the reasoning for that was, again, that the Serbian ethnic group was dispersed across the former Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman Empire, but the Austro-Hungarian, and that they felt that they could, in this new form, cover all of the territories, and because they were demographically most present, they could, in a way, dominate, clearly, the new country. That was the approach. Um, of course, historians, and many historians now criticize this approach and say that as a result, Serbia has uh, lost the position it had at the time of the meaning side of the, of the war, that it could have had a bigger Serbia, which would have been bigger than it is now. Uh, so there are these discussions for people who are interested about territory. Uh, and of course, most people are interested in territory. I personally focus on, on the people. So if you look at the next map, this is how, this is how Yugoslavia could have been uh, broken apart if we took these maps. So the one on the left uh, is 
one preferred by Belgrade because there are a lot of different small districts, right? The one on the right, uh, each one of these provinces takes the name by a river, the major river going through that part of the country, is in part ethnically motivated. So those provinces in part match the ethnic composition, but not fully again. And there is a map that I didn't show you, uh, which is also very interesting, which is one of Croatia in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which, where Croatia was really a small province around Zagreb, the capital city. And Dalmatia on the coast, and Slovenia being the third province, Dalmatia having a much stronger autonomy, and still today, a very high local, uh, strong local identity. So in a way, Croatia could have never existed could have had a Dalmatia, a Slavonia, and a Kraina as three little statelets. So depending on which period of history you pick, and you take. So uh, the borders that we saw, sorry, so this is the, at the beginning, were the communist negotiated borders. I mean, negotiated quote unquote, because we all know how democratic the communists were. And so we had these six republics, but one party. Six republics, but one party, making all the decisions. So all of these republics had their own little parliaments and some legislation, but all of the power really remains with one party and rather one person. And when that one person, which is Tito, who a lot of people who are not historians think he was Serbian because he was the president for so long, but he was actually Croatian and in part Slovenian, unless you follow some conspiracy theories that he was maybe Polish or, or who knows where I'm from. Uh, so, um, so he, it was really him. And when he died in 1980, um, uh, the system, uh, the system became more fragile. And of course, it wasn't just his death; it was also the end of the uh, Cold War, the divide in 1990, because Yugoslavia was a buffer in a way, and there was interest that it remains as such, um, and the economics. And, and we'll get to economics, but I, I think that they, they really, really crucial important. So if we go now to the ethnic map at the time, if we look on the left, uh, this was the ethnic comp uh, composition when the war started. So the last census before the war, 1991. So we see with the Slovenia very compact, which is exactly why the conflict there was not really long. And um, it was so easy. I mean, it was only Slovenia where the borders actually matched. Uh, there are, of course, minorities in Slovenia, but not very many. And there was actually a huge human rights issues, issue that they didn't recognize the citizenship of many uh, uh, Serbians or Croatians or Bosnian Muslims who lived there. And they had, uh, there was a long time, actually, a uh, lawsuit. The Council of Europe also dealt with it. But this, uh, um, deleted citizens from Slovenia. So that was that was the one human rights issue with Slovenia. Croatia was very problematic because of an important Serbian minority that was also ethnically quite um, uh, focused in a certain area called Kraina, which was this province from the uh, former Austro-Hungarian Empire. There were also many Serbs living in, in, in the capital, in Zagreb. And um, if you look at the map now to the right, uh, which is from, um, uh, no, it doesn't make, but we'll look at another one. Um, at the end, let's look at another one. This is now. Croatia is almost homogeneously Croat now. What happened is that 20 years ago, actually this summer, we, 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 20 years of this operation storm, uh, when depending on your viewpoint, uh, people fled or were expelled, but there were huge uh, human rights issues. Uh, associated with that. Um, and the rest of the Serbs who are in towns uh, are now mainly in Rijeka. So many Serbs from Zagreb either left Croatia or are undeclared now. They don't declare themselves as anything. Or they live in Rijeka. So Rijeka is this part to the left, this peninsula, uh, which used to be Italian for a long time. Uh, where now most of the Italians and Serbs live in that part, and that is the most tolerant part of Croatia at the moment. 
they're usually undeclared, but ethnically, if you look at the background, uh, many are from Serbia. Interestingly, the current prime minister of Croatia is probably ethnically Serbian. His uh, uncle passed away in Belgrade a few years ago. And he said that he's the first generation where two generations in a row they're Catholic. Because in, in Yugoslavia, a way to define it basically being Serb or Croatian is to say whether you're a Catholic or Christian or Orthodox. Um, for whatever reason, because of course there were many Serbian Catholics in Albania, but that changed over time. So, um, so Croatia now uh, almost homogenous. Uh, Bosnia um, still mixed, but with people moving to the parts where their group dominates. And um, Serbia is the most multi-ethnic part of former Yugoslavia with a number of different minorities, with Hungarian, Slovaks, and some others living there for centuries, uh, with still a number of Albanians living in Belgrade. Very interesting. 750,000 refugees that moved to Serbia. A huge economic uh, uh, impact. They still are among the poorest in Serbia, are basically the refugees from Serbia and Croatia. And of course, Kosovo, if you look at this map, and this is the OEC, and it's even worse now. So what happened is that because the Baden Terra Commission, which was this commission composed of constitutional law judges and not international law judges, decided to recognize those borders that I showed at the beginning as the borders of new states, people moved, uh, mostly uh, in a forced way, some out of, out of fear. Uh, but I feel that Yugoslavia is very much a failed case of the international community um, and, and because, because of the impact of the end where people moved to new, uh, to new borders. And um, the key role there, I mean, if you look at the federalism, um, uh, quite a bit of discussion focused on whether it could be a different form of federalism, whether it could be asymmetric so that certain publics like Scotland has compared to uh, London, certain authorities would have worked. I actually feel uh, a number of years later, having read uh, a zillion books and articles, uh, that the key role was one of politicians. And I think we see that also in the case of Czechoslovakia, uh, also in the UK, Scotland. Because these people who, who were presidents of republics wanted to be presidents of countries. And it's very clear. And I spent uh, a certain portion of my book analyzing their statements uh, and their viewpoints. They all wanted to be presidents. Uh, the final, uh, uh, and I think of the two examples of the take, if I have a little more time, if we compare Kosovo and Montenegro, Kosovo, uh, as, as the most, I say, passionate part of this life, we'll talk about that more and why at the end uh, of this panel. Uh, but a very, very much, uh, very much um, uh, of, of, a, of, a, of an important conflict which to this day remains. Um, and the goal of the conflict, unfortunately, is to clear out the area even more ethnically for both sides, and especially the dominant side, which has the more um, power right now. The um, Montenegro was a peaceful split. And it took the example of Quebec which had a referendum, which made a decision on what would be the percentage that would be valid. And in Montenegro, and it was a very interesting case where people were bribed to vote one way or another, so it was very much a financial issue too. Um, the uh, Montenegro split this And uh, could this have been avoided? Absolutely. There was a lot of willingness on behalf of the Belgrade government to negotiate pretty much two countries just under the same name. Even a different monetary and economic regime is acceptable. We came to an agreement of, I think it was about 97% of all tariffs, because we were negotiating tariff by tariff, uh, because they had a completely different economic system. And we had to at least agree, and that was the EU's viewpoint, on the external trade regime, uh, to be called a country. And then the EU, I think, was just tired and said, fine. And um, again, we had a president in Montenegro who wanted to be president of the country for a number of other reasons, not just to be president, but to have a certain power and everything that comes with that. Um, and now we have a set of issues in Montenegro which, is, which are not 
yet very much uh, explored, but probably should be, uh, with Serbs now becoming a minority in, uh, because there isn't a clear majority. There are people who feel Montenegro right now, there are people who feel Serbian, there is an Albanian minority, there's different ethnic groups. Um, and uh, there is now a big issue with the Serbian language, with the church, um, which, which is very interesting how it's all uh, happening. And with the EU providing a framework, but not always really taking advantage of the framework to resolve these remaining uh, human rights issues. So, in the end, I mean, if we if we try to reflect upon what is the impact on other countries, uh, I think one of the lessons learned is is that um, international communities should attempt to be less selective because dangerous precedents are created. Uh, I sometimes say cynically that it's a terrorist. One, uh, you know, why why Kosovo got tense at the time that it did, with a very devolved autonomy having been granted to it just before, uh, and uh, it's not a very good uh, message to be to be sent. And, and for my colleagues who, who were studying language, I think it's very interesting to study when do you use the word liberated, uh, and when do you use the word or crush the uh, rebellion. So are Russians crushing a rebellion, or are they re uh, liberating, or are they invading? Uh, it all depends on your perspective, and we're taking a different perspective depending on the politics. And I think another interesting study is the one on economics, and if we have more time, I'd like to talk about that, where I feel that if uh, the economics were better in 1990, if we didn't have the debt crisis and the debt really uh, increasing from the 80s, there was more attraction to Yugoslavia as an economic powerhouse joining the EU, and at the time we were actually negotiating an association agreement or talking about it, uh, that the war could have been avoided. Uh, uh, but it would also have had to take leadership from people representing different, uh, uh, different republics and then wanting to do what's best for the people rather than what's best for themselves. And, and politics So I think I just opened uh, a different questions and I would love to discuss more. Um, but I really feel in the end that personality matters of the leaders, of the political leaders, how they use the media, how they use the facts. I wrote a paper on how uh, the centuries-old ancient hatred between Croats and Serbs is actually completely untrue. Uh, we were in conflict for less than 100 years. Uh, and, um, so, so the, the personality of politicians matter and the economics matters. And that's why it's different in Scotland uh, or Belgium compared to this one. Yeah. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.
terms of agency and, and, and how contingent a lot of these things become. Um, this is an ethnographic map of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, prior to the war, from the last census, 1991. Uh, blue represents Croats, red represents Serbs, green represents Muslims, as they were called at that point. Now they're, they're, they're from Bosnia. Uh, and you can see there were no clean lines. There were there were there were clear uh, there were clear areas where people people were in a majority. Durvar was 99% Serb, for example, in western Western Bosnia, and now is is predominantly Serb again. Though that ethnic that ethnic picture changed uh, as a result of Operation Storm in 1995. The Drina Valley over here on the on the eastern edge had a lot of of Muslims. Now there's been some return to Srebrenica, which is up there, and that sort of book. Uh, but uh, but generally, it's it's a much different picture now. Um, I want to talk particularly about post-war Bosnia uh, and and how things have developed since since the war. Uh, first, one needs to know what the, the what was how the state is constructed. Um, a lot of attributes that we normally attribute to states, uh, even including armies. Uh, but also policing, taxation power. All of these things were vested at, so at what was called the entity level. Uh, this was the result of the Dayton Peace Agreement negotiated in Dayton in uh, November 1995. Uh, there were two entities. The Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was, which was formed the previous year uh, to end, uh, for lack of a better term, a war within the a war between uh, the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina Army and the Croat separatist army called the HBO. Um, and that, uh, that was roughly 51% of the territory. The other roughly 49% was Republika Srpska. Effectively, that was a ceasefire line. It was negotiated to make sure that the percentages add up, added up because the basis for that 51-49 split were arrived at by what was called the contact group. The United States, Britain, France, Germany, and Russia later Italy joined that uh, in 1994. So uh, that area that they called the egg under Puch along the river bus actually was, was handed back to, to after, after the summer offensive uh, in 1995. The only part that fell outside the ambit of this split was an area up there in the northeastern corner called Dorchko. So this was one of the first places to get ethnically cleansed in the war. And you can see why it has strategic importance, because uh, without control of Perchko, the two halves of the Publica Srpska are separated. Um, what it was done, what, so they couldn't agree on that at the Dayton Agreement. It was put up to binding arbitration. Ultimately, the arbitral award said, it's a condominium, but neither entity controls that territory. It's a district. So, Republika Srpska is unitary. Federation is broken up into cantons, of which there are 10, uh, a number with, 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 with the majority population, and two mixed, uh, plus the district. So it's a very complex state structure uh, that was designed effectively around the interests of the signatories of the deal. It would not have that complexity if it wasn't designed as a preservation mechanism for the interest groups who had to, had to come around the table and sign, and sign into it. So it wasn't really designed as a governance system so much as a power sharing system first. Its functionality was not the primary, primary goal. Its ability to preserve the power of the people who were the signatories was the primary goal. Uh, and after which, 60, well, 54,000 NATO troops entered to enforce the peace agreement. Now, um, as I said, the, 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 the role of the state was very limited in the Dayton Constitution. Uh, Annex 4 of the Dayton Agreement is the Constitution of Bosnia Herzegovina that still prevails, but there are a number of other, other annexes. Annex 7 uh, regulates uh, and, and, uh, refugee return. Annex 10 creates an oversight body uh, called the Office of the High Representative, which was an infest essentially the enforcement mechanism for the Dayton Agreement. This is uh, normally this sort of thing would be handled by the United Nations. Since the United Nations was viewed I mean, properly, in my view, as having been discredited from the war experience, it was essentially set up as an ad hoc body to oversee it by, by about 50 odd countries called the Peace Implementation Council, uh, 
built around that contact group that I mentioned earlier, but including a number of other states. Um, and the International High Representative has the responsibility to ensure that Dayton is adhered to. For the first two years of the Dayton Agreement, after the Dayton Agreement, uh, effectively there was a there was separation of forces along that line, uh, but the state didn't function. They couldn't even agree on where to meet uh, to, 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 to have meetings in the state government. Uh, elections were held very soon after the war, uh, in September 1996, and what effectively they amounted to was an ethnic referendum. Uh, uh, and uh, so it solidified the control that was established uh, as a result of the war and as a result of the Dayton Agreement, uh, which made it all the more impervious to later change. Now, um, you really have about three or four periods of, of international international engagement is absolutely essential to understanding what's, what's happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina for the past two decades, um, two and a half. Um, first was this two years where essentially society became more divided because as I mentioned, people wanted to get on the right side of the line to be a part of the majority community. So if you happened to be on the wrong side of the line, you felt insecure. And the worst case of this was in, in Gurbovica, which is a, a was along the front line in Sarajevo, where um, Serbs were encouraged to leave and felt scared to stay, and NATO didn't. NATO NATO forces effectively allowed people to be compelled to leave, um, and uh, so you have to remember also that in 1995, when when President asking for authorization to send troops. It seems very quaint now, uh, after, after wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Iraq, but there was, Vietnam syndrome was definitely very much in effect at that point, and fear of casualties was huge. So there was all sorts of, of concern over whether casualties would be taken, uh, whether, how long these troops would be deployed, so they were authorized for one year. Uh, and that, was renewed for six months, another six months. Finally, at the end of 1997, there was recognition both on, on, on the side of Washington, but also on the broader international side that there was, this wasn't working. There needed to be some sort of very clear enforcement mechanism uh, to ensure that the Dayton Agreement was adhered to, that obstructionism uh, on its implementation uh, would, would, uh, would have consequences. So, Peace Implementation Council agreed at a meeting in Bonn, which was still the German capital at the time in December 1997, to uh, clarify the role of the High Representative to say not only be the final authority in theater, but that means that you could annul laws that are in violation of the Dayton Peace Agreement, impose laws to ensure implementation of the Dayton Peace Agreement, remove political figures who are obstructing elements of the Dayton Peace Agreement and even ban them from political life. Uh, so this was a much bigger stick than previously had been wielded, but it wasn't wielded strategically for a long time. It was only starting in about 2000, uh, immediately after the aftermath of the Kosovo War. But also, as democratic transitions uh, occurred in first in Croatia and Serbia, uh, when it was viewed that, that there, was, there were more possibilities now you really had two state-building high representatives, if you will. Wolfgang Petrich, who was an Austrian diplomat who started as high rep in 1999 uh, and up through 2002, and it was under his uh, tutelage that uh, a constitutional court ruling said, if you are, if you are <coughs> people, uh, any one of the three constituent peoples in Bosnia, it's going to be known with the Croats, Serbs, and Bosniaks, your rights, your constituent throughout the state, the understanding prior to that was your only constituent where you're a majority. So your only constituent in the Federation if you're Croat, or Bosnia, and only constituent in the Republic of Serbska if you're Serb. This force, force changes to the entity constitutions, but the constitutional court ruling wasn't implemented for two years. Ultimately, it was pressed forward uh, by Petrich. Um, then you had Paddy Ashton, uh, former leader of the Liberal Democrats here in Britain, uh, who became the high representative in, in May 2002. Full disclosure, I and a colleague of mine advised him on what 
maximum that he could do within within his mandate uh, to try to, to to create a more functioning state. Um, and it was under his tutelage, really, that a lot of state institutions were created, uh, uh, particularly the judiciary. There was a court of Bosnia Herzegovina that was created to adjudicate domestic trials on war crimes, but also organized crime and corruption. The state was given a direct source of funding through the indirect taxation authority that collects value <coughs> as well as customs. Uh, and something that was unthinkable a decade before, uh, unification of the military uh, into a single army, which was, was agreed in 2005 and uh, implemented the following year. Um, so that was the high watermark of state construction uh, and there were certain prevailing assumptions. One was, uh, if you build it, they will come, effectively. If you prod the political elites into uh, developing state institutions to uh, ultimately allow for European Union integration and NATO integration, they'll want to do it. And one day they'll wake up and want the state to function. Um, it was for that reason that there was a real distinct downshift at the end, the beginning of 2006. The assumption was that European Union at large was going to solve this problem. And there didn't need, there wasn't a need for sticks anymore. We only needed carrots. Um, uh, that was the beginning of the downward trajectory, I would posit, has been prevalent in the past nine and a half years. Uh, not just stagnation, but rollback, progression in terms of government functionality, in terms of politicization of the judiciary uh, across a broad front. And I want to try to explain why I think that's, that's, that's the case. Up until 2000, beginning of 2006, I apologize for this being simplistic, but there were really, if you think of this in, in three levels, the international community, and by that mean, that's, I know that's a blob, amorphous term. In Bosnia, it's more specific than it's usually understood because it basically means the pick steering board, which is the, that contact group I mentioned earlier, plus Turkey representing the organization of the Islamic Conference, the Dutch and the Spanish as observers, uh, and the European Commission, plus the European Union, plus NATO. That's generally the West plus the Russians, effectively, uh, is, is the common conception of what that is. Um, in an enforcement role, with a constitutional role in the structure of the state. The political elite, and, and, and Dr. Osipo made a, something I, a comment, a, a point that I agree with completely. Uh, this is, the, the interests, their interests were paramount. I'm protecting them. The state was built around their interests at Dayton. And you would expect that, they were the signatories. That is a union of political, business, criminal, and I would add media to that nexus. It's all the same group of people. And while their interests differ on the structure of what the state should be, they come together on, to be very crude about it, can I keep what I stole? Can I keep stealing? Can I remain unaccountable, both legally and politically? This system allows you to do that. There's nothing the EU can offer that's better than that. Um, now, how do they, why is this a dotted line looking down? Uh, because they never really had to be accountable to citizens in any meaningful way. They could buy social peace or compel consent through two levers, patronage and fear. Uh, patronage, uh, particularly through a large public sector, uh, but also it's a package deal with fear usually. Uh, if you're not sure, you know, your vote is secret and Uncle Jovan has a job with the local administration, are you really going to vote against the authorities? You might stay home because you think they're all crooks, uh, but you're probably not going to take that risk. So through 2006, the political elite had to look up because they were afraid, metaphorically speaking, of getting their heads chopped off. And since politics is a for-profit enterprise, that's bad for business. After February 2006, it became entropic. There were no rules. Legally, there are still rules. Effectively, there were not rules because there was no enforcement of those rules. So you 
it still used the same levers on the citizens. And everybody is a rational actor within this construct. This is not people not getting it. You could have citizens cite new chapter and verse, who's in what racket, who's getting paid, and they'll still vote for their guy or they'll stay home, or they'll elect the biggest crooks because they're likely they're they're the ones who are most likely to give them a job or keep them in a job. So it's rational actors with perverse incentives. Now, I know I have about two minutes. Um, the way forward, uh, potential way forward, really has to be a partnership between citizens and external actors in recognition of the interests of the political elite. Um, again, these nut guys aren't uniquely evil. They just have unique latitude, and they can get away with a lot. Um, <laughs> so long as the political elite of the country feel like they can operate without restraint, uh, and they don't have a mobilized constituency against them, uh, they're going to continue to be on autopilot and take advantage of the system. And effectively, uh, the policy, the Western policy now, which is led by the European Union, amounts to a containment policy. Uh, not admitting that there are security elements to the risk uh, publicly, uh, admitting it privately, but not wanting to use security means to, to ensure against it. So the only lever you have that is money. Throw money at it. And effectively, that means buying social peace for the political elite. And from down here at the citizen level, it seems to the citizens that the internationals are allied with the political elite against them. And I think that's an accurate reading. Not for the, not, it's not probably conceived that way in Brussels, but that's the way it looks in Sarajevo and elsewhere in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, final example. How could this work in practice? You're probably aware, when Croatia joined the European Union in 2013, uh, that border became the EU border, and because Bosnia hadn't done its homework, Bosnian politicians hadn't prepared for it, uh, a lot of agricultural goods could not be exported, not just to Croatia, but to the wider EU, particularly dairy products. That's where they get really hit the mark. Um, now, why wasn't this done? Partly, it's just the usual administrative show game of who's, who's responsible. Uh, not surprisingly, there's no agriculture ministry in Bosnia and Herzegovina because it wasn't a priority. I doubt it even came across anybody's minds that they knew that this was an issue. Um, up until 2006, uh, the current leadership of Republika Srpska was willing to accept one, and the EU used to advocate it up until 2009. But they backed off. They said, we're tired of being told, no, you guys just need to coordinate. There's no effort. There's been no political will to try to coordinate on this. Who got hit? Farmers, obviously. Which farmers got hit the worst? Farmers up there in that northern part of Republika Srpska, abutting Croatia. That's where the best farmland for dairy farming is. Uh, now, uh, the argument against having an agriculture ministry is this is giving competences to the state. This is, this is against Republika Srpska's interest. The fun part is you have Bosnian and Serb farmers advocating precisely for a Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, the EU won't meet with them. They, that would be that would make waves because from the EU perspective and the enlargement perspective, I I just shut it off. Um, from an enlargement perspective, your partners are supposed to be the political elites of the given country. They're supposed to be responsible to their citizens, and it is assumed that they're democratically accountable. That doesn't that script doesn't work in Bosnia Herzegovina. You have a potential constituency for functioning state, but it's it's not where it's supposed to be according to the enlargement model. So um, I've run out of time long since, uh, but uh, but I look forward to to, to your questions and, and our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.
really a light, a light, a light that, uh, that wrap is the, like a sandwich, is the international community and the citizens of one country is trying to, you know, and of course, you know, when you talk about the, the people on the ground, was in between, and uh, well, I, when I was in Georgia, and, uh, I was happy to see that happen. Because when, when, when we keep, we keep, Saakashvili, the first president, or was educated in the United States, or in the he's, his government is incredibly good. His government is uh, is very uh, because I, I know somebody doing business with him. It's uh, not as corrupt as what it's used to be now. But then there's a there's a lot, what's happening is the guy who got rich in Russia becomes the richest guy in that country in Georgia, and he become the so he used to be prime minister and then become the president. And then things turn to be really kind of corrupt because that guy is political strong and economic also strong. So now, right now it's the third president that's coming and things just really going down because I, I talked to some of the locals and a lot of people are not satisfied. Oh, my question, well, my question is that uh, So how how we, how you see this? Do you see this as, as still a form of democracy, with uh, with people are unsatisfied with this political result, and they know what's going on, but with the definition of democracy that it should be people are actually having and making a choice, but they're making a choice that is not actually very uh, satisfying to them. They, they feel a little bit hopeless. Okay. Yeah, let, let's go to the question. Okay, and another question. Uh, and I would attribute it mainly to that, 
rather than because if you look at and you listen to people as well as looking at the polling data, their concerns are pretty much identical on the economic front. Uh, and they, they're all being had pretty much the same way. Um, so to get to your question, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lack of political representation. We think we present Bosnia as a functioning democracy, partly Americans in particular, because we midwifed it, so it has to be. It's an oligarchy. It was designed to be an oligarchy. It's a competitive oligarchy now, but it does not function in a representative democratic way, I would posit. If it did, well, let me put it this way. If I thought the political elites that have, that are, have been elected and continue to be elected were genuinely representative, I would have split a long time ago because I'm, I'm uh, stubborn, but I'm not a masochist. Uh, but I genuinely, the, the, the disconnect, I would attribute to a lack of political accountability, and that's a systemic problem, which is why I think uh, if you're going to build a functioning democracy there, it has to be built on local self-government and direct representation. Without that, I don't think you get around this blockage. I'll try to jump in. Well, essentially, the issue in Bosnia is that the Serbs and Croats don't want to live in Bosnia. So they resist the central authority. And the international community is fed up with all the more power that has tried quite the opposite, which is to add more power to the center, to create the state, which a lot of people, the majority, do not want to belong to. So it's a very, very difficult approach. Um, and so if you talk about the agriculture issue, the international community says it should have a lab at the central level, giving certificates and whatever you need. The Republic of Serbia, the Serb government says, why not give us that right so that we can do this? Um, and, and so, so that's, that's the, the issue. Uh, in terms of how power is devolved, um, actually it's simplest in the Serbian part because they have one entity and although most of the aid, and we're talking more than 90% to the Bosnian, Bosnian broad part, it's the Serbian part of Bosnia which has developed the most. Uh, I think very much as a result of a simple government. And it's not a uh, inherently ethical and uncorrupt government. And it's the kind of approach that we have in these uh, ethnic songs, you know, this uh, one hero who was fighting the Ottoman drinking wine as he was riding his horse and he gave half the wine to the horse, this famous horse, and half the wine he drank on the way to the battle and of course fought valiantly. And so people are saying, okay, half the wine to the horse and half the wine, okay, some corruption we will bear as long as they do some good for us. It's that bad. So that's the approach. So the Republic of Serbs and government, they are aware that there is corruption, but they're also doing good things for the economy so they can bear. And so all of these proposals for a new rape in Bosnia, what they have done is they have said we should take the model of Switzerland. There is SC, this think tank, uh, some other think tanks that have made a proposal. But what they have said is we should simplify the complicated, very complicated part in the Bosnian Muslim Federation. But then also, what they are also insisting on is that the Serbian entity should then also come down in terms of the power that it has. And that's why none of these proposals have succeeded. Uh, because what the Bosnian Serbs now feel is that, okay, they will not let us split. We're not allowed to have uh, a referendum, although they've been allowed to, essentially. Uh, it's considered a blasphemy. So you can actually, uh, this idea is that you can, you can leave once. So Bosnia can leave uh, Yugoslavia. You can recognize those borders, but then you cannot recognize the new borders. You cannot split twice. It's like you have to stop somewhere. So the approach is at the first uh, break. Uh, so the Bosnians are saying, being practical, they're saying, okay, they're not letting us split. And why they're not letting us split? Because it, it, it's because it's very difficult to divide the rest of Bosnia, the Muslim and the Croat part. And, and that Muslim part becomes economically very unsustainable, which is why the Serbs are not allowed to leave, essentially. Uh, other than a uh, number of moral issues that are raised about the war, and do you have a right to go face the war, and what happened or not. And, uh, so the Bosnian Serbs are being practical and they're saying, okay, we'll stay, but don't, and that's why they're, they're actually the most fervent supporters of the Dayton Peace Accords right now. They're saying, don't take away more power. And why don't we learn from other countries like 
even the German lender or Belgium or Spain or whatever other system that's federal, devolve more power to us so that we can economically prosper. And then we'll bear with this common Bosnia. We will uh, take some of the central institutions. Uh, but the problem is that the international community took the stance that not only what's really needed, like in Switzerland, should be central, but as much as possible so that the state as unitary as possible is created so that it, in this way hoping to, to counterpart the, the ethnic divide, which clearly has not worked. And I think it's very interesting how you, you talked about Lukashenko, because in fact, I mean, as terrible as this sounds, you can compare Gary Ashdown to Lukashenko, who very undemocratically took up power. Uh, he decided to really uh, change some of the democratically elected politicians, as bad as they were. I mean, you don't send a good signal what the democracy because democracy has its faults, obviously, we all live with them. Um, and uh, I think really terribly uh, represented in that sense the international community. And, and, and so the, the way to resolve the issues in Bosnia is actually to say, okay, we will no longer pressure that we take up as much as possible to the central level. We should evolve. We should simplify the level of governance in the uh, Bosnian Muslim Croat part, because that is the problem. We keep fighting each other. That's the big problem in Bosnia, uh, because it's not clear who moves what and how. Uh, and too many people are in the public sector. And the, the Bosnian Serbs are especially annoyed with the central government because all of the VAT goes to fund that government. And there is no limit how big the government can be. So the government keeps growing. So instead of investing money in infrastructure, a lot of the money goes to these public administration officials in, in, in Sarajevo and in different capitals. So there's all these issues that are created because, because everyone has a different premise of what Boston should be all about. And in the meantime, all the young and educated people are leaving. So, you know, who are you building a country for? And, and this is, you know, the same message that we given to the international community or the Boston Serb leadership or the Boston Croc or the Boston Muslim leadership. Your people are leaving. And Bosnia is, is shrinking. And especially the educated people are leaving. And, and so it's very sad. Uh, it's a very sad situation. Bosnia, and, and where again, it's about them, it's about the politicians, it's about people who are protecting the system because it works because it works for them. So, not very realistic uh, conclusion. Well, that's the reality. Uh, it is idea in this world that it's the same solutions in different places, in different times, and uh, that's just like this. We are not here to solve we are just to listen and see how things may develop. We can discuss them further, but hopefully it's kind of further for thought for us so we can discuss uh, Scotland and Britain and the future in light of what we have already heard and will hear after lunch about uh, the issues which we are discussing in this conference. So unless